We started very grassroots. A group of us would see each other once or twice a year at industry events and thought, man, there's so many Latinos where we work at our work site, but what can we do to help boost the number of executives? This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Great to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views this week with our newsmaker interview with Alva Carrasco and Harold Humphreys, the president and vice president of Latinos in Transit. I know you'll enjoy that interview. Stay tuned for that right after the news headlines. And at the end of today's podcast, we take a look at an in-depth look at a recent study on what we can do to attract more drivers, more public transportation operators to the industry and to keep them once they get hired. All that on this episode of Transit Unplugged News and Views. Now for headline news from around the world. First, starting here in the United States, the U.S. House of Representatives passed its fiscal year 2023 bill funding transportation on July 20th. It fully funds the public transportation authorizations that were laid out in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. The total public transit appropriation exceeds the act's authorization levels for 2023. Specifically, the bill together with the IIJA's advanced appropriations, provides a total of $21.7 billion for public transit in fiscal year 2023, an increase of $1.2 billion, or 6%, from the fiscal year 2022 enacted level. This total appropriation is $416 million greater than the amount authorized in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. In addition, it provides $17.1 billion for passenger and freight rail, an increase of $489 million, or 3%, to the FY22 enacted level. The bill will now move to the Senate, and the Senate Appropriations Committee has announced that it intends to unveil its draft appropriation bills in the next few weeks. In other news from around the world, authorities in Rome are to impose new electric scooter rules, such as restricting their use to adults with ID after a number of crashes and near misses in the city. This has been an issue that has affected a lot of cities around the world. The scooter rental market has boomed in recent years with 14,500 scooters currently available in Rome, the Italian capital, provided by seven licensed companies. And authorities are moving to clamp down on the situation including with people riding on pavement and sometimes more than one person involved. There's been 17 people killed in Italy in the last two years after incidents involving electric scooters, according to a consumer protection association. So they are looking to reduce the speed. Uh, They're looking to uh, cut it from 15 miles per hour down to 20 kilometers per hour on roads and six in pedestrian areas. They're expected to come into force in January of 2023. They're also going to include restricting the use of electric scooters to adults who have an ID and limiting the number of operators in the city to three. So there's going to be some clampdowns coming. We'll tell you more about that as that develops, because that is an interesting development that could affect many cities around Europe and the U.S. Speaking of the U.S., back to Chicago, one of my favorite cities in the country, and a recent guest of ours, Melinda Metzger, the CEO, uh, just had a big win this week. Pace is Pace Suburban Bus in Chicago and outside Chicago has celebrated the opening of a Plainfield Bus Maintenance and Storage Garage. The facility is Pace's first new fixed route garage in more than three decades and will allow for the expansion of its Bus on Shoulder Express service, which I'm very excited about and think it's a wonderful program. The ribbon cutting ceremony was held July 21st to mark the completion of Pace's new maintenance and storage facility near the bus company's Plainfield Park and Ride facility. It's a $52 million facility. It's built on an almost 12 acre site and was funded by Pace using resources from the state's Rebuild Illinois Capital Program. Congratulations to them and to the state of Illinois for what uh, their chairman called their forward-thinking bill, which allowed bus on shoulder. Uh, The facility will begin operations in the fall and will allow for the expansion of Pace's bus on shoulder express service and create space for additional vehicles needed to operate the service, which takes commuters from various south region park and rides to downtown Chicago using the shoulder on I-55 to bypass congestion. 
Pre-pandemic, ridership on the service grew by, get this, more than 600% since the implementation of shoulder use in 2011. The service is again seeing full parking lots and buses as riders return. Melinda Metzger said, because of the support we've received on local, regional, and state levels, we're standing in Pace's first new fixed route garage in more than 30 years. The facility is a win-win for our passengers, for our employees, and for our whole region. Congratulations to all on seeing this important development. And finally, my good friend, Secretary General Mohammed Mezgani has been reappointed as UITP Secretary General for a new five-year term. UITP, for those in the United States, is like the global APTA. Uh, they are the public transportation association that um, over a thousand transit systems around the world are part of. They have regional operations, and the board um, made that appointment and announced it just recently. Mr. Mezgani said, I'm proud of the accomplishments of the association in the past five years, which would not have been possible without the excellent collaboration between our diligent staff and engaged members. I'm looking forward to the coming mandate and thank the executive board for putting its trust in me again. And the UITP president, Khalid al said, I'm pleased that Muhammad has been reappointed as Secretary General of UITP for the coming five years. The past mandate has proven that under his leadership, UITP is in good hands. I'm hopeful that the association will continue to reinforce itself as the International Association for All Urban Transport Related Matters, growing its global membership and reach in the process. Congratulations to Muhammad. We did feature the UITP MENA conference, Middle East North Africa conference, on our recent television episode of Transit Unplugged TV from Dubai, where I was able to visit the conference and speak there and um, moderate a panel on the main stage. It was a wonderful experience, and uh, it was a great conference with over 1,200 people there, their first kind of in-person conference since the pandemic. And they're, of course, planning a major exhibition next June in Barcelona. I can't wait to be there for that one. That's it for this edition of Transit Unplugged News and Views for our news headlines. Now stay tuned for our in-depth interview with Harold Humphreys, Alva Carrasco, the Vice President and President of Latinos in Transit. Then be sure to stay tuned to the end to take a look at what some agencies are saying and what a recent study is saying needs to be done to attract and retain commercial bus operators for our industry. I'm Paul Comfort. Great to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views this week with my good friends, the president and vice president of Latinos in Transit, Alva Carrasco and Harold Humphrey. Thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Harold and I have been friends for a long time in the industry, but Alva, you and I have become friends lately. We were just, all of us, along with a thousand other people, were just at the Comto conference. And there I was able to attend your breakfast and so excited to uh, be involved with your organization and other ways too that we'll get to later. But first off, welcome and thank you for being our guest. And why don't you tell us some about the organization? It's a very cool organization. I've been able to do a couple of events with you guys. Alva, you want to kick us off? Sure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having both Harold and I. We're, we're very honored to be your guests on today's Unplugged. We, we're happy to unplug with you. So thank there you. you. go. So yeah, so Latinos in Transit was founded in 2016. We're, we're getting close to our sixth birthday. And we're a nonprofit and we're, we're based in the United States. We don't have a headquarters, but we are a, a national group that we hope will become international. We're a nonprofit that was created to promote the advancement and development of Latinos and other minorities in the transportation industry. Our members are made up of public and private transportation professionals from across the United States. And we meet regularly and share information and we celebrate each other's professional development. So, you know, we we're going on our sixth year. We were we started very grassroots. A group of us would see each other once or twice a year at industry events and thought, man, there's so many Latinos where we work at our work site. But how, what can we do to help? boost the number of executives, hmm. the decision makers to have more people of color. Right. And, you know, being Latina and coming into the industry now 30 years in this industry, when I started, oh, I, I mean, even women were not as common 
to, you know, to be seen at a conference, industry conference, things have dramatically improved, but we have so much work to do, so much work. We really are trying to encourage other Latinos and, and other people of color to move up in the ranks, become decision makers. We want to see more C-suite, Latinos in the C-suite, transit board members, you know, get involved in commissions or committees that have some say in local infrastructure projects and, you know, policy and, and decisions that are right. made for communities of color. That's good. And Harold, as vice chair, why don't you tell us some about some of the challenges, other challenges that you see the organization helping to overcome? Well, I think the organization itself is just the rapid growth that we're experiencing currently with the membership and really just organizing and structuring the organization to move forward as we grow. On a regular basis, I'm asked about, you know, lit and what we do and, and all the things we have going on and how can people be involved. So I think that's that's the growing pains that we're experiencing now. And hopefully with our new administrative director on board, that he'll organize things for us. That's Jess Segovia also known as the ADA guru, that he'll get us organized and put us on a path to success to continue to grow and, and absorb that. That's great. Alva, do you all have local chapters like Comto does, or is it just a national organization now? How does that work? It's, it's on the to-do list, Paul. Like Harold said, we are growing pains. The, so we, we were formed in 2016, and it really took us a couple of years to really you know get our focus because it's just so many initiatives that the inaugural board of directors wanted to tackle, but, you know, there's just no way we could do all of it. So we try to narrow our focus to what we can do right away. And that's creating opportunities for our members to network and to develop them, you know, workforce development, get some education, some opportunities where they can learn from each other and from industry subject matter experts. That's good. Harold, um, tell us some about that in the Leadership Academy, that that's one of the one of the projects you all have going on, right? Yeah, the Leadership Academy actually started back in February, and it's bringing some transit professionals such as Dr. Beverly Scott, myself, I taught a class, but really we brought in about 30 students and, and folks that wanted to advance their career in transit. And we've had some great leaders that teach these classes. It's a class a month for five months that'll graduate at the Transform Conference in October. Really excited about it. But the leaders bring the simplest things as how to manage what I would call the daily operations, the labor, those things that are really in deep in operations to finance and also to subjects that, you know, as far as regulatory issues and things like that. So we really have a great group of instructors for that and really excited to see this group advance through the program. And Alva, I know you and I have been working together some, along with Harold and others, on a potential new scholarship program through another group that I'm a part of called the North American Transit Alliance. Tell us about what you're hoping to do with your scholarships. Thank you for that question. So the scholarship program is one of our strategic plan initiatives that is one of the, the aspects of, our, of Latinos in Transit's mission is to develop our future leaders. And so we actually have Latinos in Transit with, with the partnership of MV Transportation. We have for three years in a row, and actually this year, 2023, will be our fourth year that we contribute to the American Public Transportation Foundation, which is, as many of you know, is administered through APTA. We have been contributing a scholarship or for, I should say, a contribution for a scholarship to be provided to a Latino that is pursuing a career in transit. That's through APTF. Now, this year, what we're doing is launching our own scholarship program where we will have a committee and we will accept applications for scholarships. What we plan to do is every year budget, set aside money from that we receive from our membership dues for scholarships for minorities. And they don't all have to be Latinos. Of course, we really am trying to, to market these opportunities so Latinos will be, be interested in entering the transportation industry, whether That's they go to the public or the private side. Right. 
That's great. I was able to attend your breakfast at Comto that Lit held with about 100 people there or more. The room was packed and you gave a great overview of a of a bunch of different initiatives you've got going on. And we don't have time to cover them all today, but if people want to know more about Latinos in Transit and the work you're doing and how they can be involved, where should they go online? They can go to latinosintransit.org. We do have a LinkedIn page as well as Facebook and Instagram, but I think LinkedIn is where we have the biggest following. I crack up on that because I, I, I created that page five years ago and remember when we had like 12 followers. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now it's nearing 2000. I'm, I'm really proud of, of that because we have just grown so fast and, and really, and you know, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. It's the pandemic and the subsequent events from the shutdowns and the protests and Black Lives Matter, all of these things really opened up this new lens into equity. And that's when I noticed that we really started getting a lot more interest at Latinos in Transit, which is we're very grateful for. Yeah. Let's talk about what the future might be, Harold, for Latinos in Transit. Alva's been carrying the mantle, leading the organization for the past few years, and but eventually it may turn over to you if things go according to, I think, her plan at least. Uh, what do you have in mind for the future of Latinos in Transit? Well, she can never leave. That's number one. <laughs> okay, I, She knows a lot of people and has done a great job just building this organization. So I think we, we just continue to focus, uh, build the scholarship program. We're going to build a mentorship program. And of course, grow our, our strength, so to speak. And when I say that, we're going to take on certain issues such as and one in particular that I'm really passionate about is the barriers to becoming, you know, a transit professional. One in particular, and I'll go ahead and mention it now, is the, the CDL, the language barriers. As If you didn't know this, in most states, they, they, they have these different rules for the way that you have to have be Korean, you can be, you know, Spanish, uh, Spanish heritage, but every CDL test has to be administered in English because that's what the FMCSA says. It must be in English. You must be able to communicate to the public. So I think as I look at all the states and the variables there, there are some gaps that we can push to for some, you know, push for some definite standardization of how we administer CDLs. Because I think that's a barrier for minorities to become transit professionals. Because usually they start at the lower ranks as an operator. They want to get their CDLs. They can't pass the tests. So I think that's kind of the focus that I'd like to take the, you know, the, the cause of lit, the mission of values and try to focus on things like that in the big picture as well. So as we move forward, I, that's some of the things that I definitely want to focus on. Yeah. And that's something that you have a little experience on. We haven't talked about that, but I mean, you've run the, you were in charge of the buses in Dallas at DART and now you're, you are in charge of all the bus transportation in Atlanta for MARTA. And so you have, you know, a few things about needing operators, right? That seems to be a message that resonates throughout the industry. That is correct. And again, just that, you know, we, we have a heavy Hispanic population here and, uh, you know, you go back and you read the regulations and you say, well, they need to be able to communicate with the public. Well, if we have a heavy Hispanic population, why is it the operator has to only speak English and may not be able to speak Spanish? So a lot to do. We definitely are short here. We're continuing to be creative as, as we can to, to get operators like everybody else. So it's a, it's a challenge. Thank you. Uh, Alva, last question. Why don't you tell us about what you all have planned for the upcoming APTA conference? You've got some big events there and, and you know, a breakfast and all kinds of things and how people might be involved. You've given them the website, but but yes. uh, let's talk about what's coming up later this fall. Yes. Okay. So thank you. Oh my God. I'm so excited you asked about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, my favorite time of the year. So actually before the APTA conference this fall is Hispanic Heritage Month, which as many of you know, is September 15th through October 15th of every year. This year, we're bringing back the Lit Leadership Summit. We are going to hold it in Dallas, Texas, September 23rd and 24th. So please save the date. We have some surprises in store. We're already lining up our speakers and our sponsors, and we're really excited about seeing everyone because our, our first summit was in 2019 before the the pandemic. And so then right. we, you know, we had to go on pause there. Then, then we will have our annual breakfast meeting for our members at the annual conference in Seattle. 
this year during the APTA Transform Conference. That usually happens Sunday morning, the day, right, you know, right when things are kicking off. Right. And last but not least, we're also adding a reception to celebrate our Leadership Academy graduates and announcement of our lit scholarship recipients. So Excellent. we got a lot going on and that was a ton twister, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you covered it all very well. And both of you, I wish you very much success as you continue to promote this. As you know, I'm very interested and passionate about this subject. And thank you, Alva, for agreeing to review my upcoming book on oh, conversations on equity and inclusion in public transportation. And thank you for connecting me with Veronica Vanderpool, who is the deputy administrator of the FTA, where we were able to meet and, and talk about this very important topic. So I look forward to continuing to work with you in various capacities and wish you all the best as you continue to promote equity and inclusion in public transportation. Thank you, Paul. Muchas gracias. You're doing a good job there, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hi. I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. Happy summer, everyone. I hope you get the opportunity to take some time off while schedules are more relaxed and school is out. But if you're still hard at work at a transit organization, I have to tell you it's time to start thinking about marketing your services to go back to school. One of the smartest approaches I know to marketing transit at back to school time is to set up three important dates the few weeks right before school starts, the day classes start, and then a final messaging period about a month after that day when school is in full swing. Two or three weeks before school starts is the time to remind families and students that your system can help them get to school. Your messaging should include what routes they need to know about and the policies and pass information for student riders. The next important date is the day most classes begin, but your messaging doesn't have to be heavy or even particularly broad on this date because guess what? People are going to be pretty busy getting kids to school. But the third date on your calendar will catch riders and potential riders when most of that busy has calmed down and a routine has begun to establish itself. In my opinion, this is the time for your most aggressive messaging. Families and students are feeling more comfortable about getting to school, and parents in particular could be looking for ways to not have to do all the driving. If you'd like to talk more about marketing your school transit services or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Hi, this is Mike Bismar, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about leadership, mentorship, and kindness with the hopes that it'll inspire you to pay it forward. I had the pleasure last week of speaking on a panel at the Ontario Transit Expo with Terry Fisher of Insight Strategies and Patrick Utica, Transit Planner at the TTC and Vice Chair of the Youth and Emerging Leaders Subcommittee with CUTA. The panel was focused on the next generation of leaders, the direct link that mentorship and kindness have on succession planning and identifying those leaders. With the continued hot topic being retention and even reevaluation of your workforce, it's never been more important to ensure that you're constantly working on identifying the next leaders, however, continually sharing knowledge and the vision of your workplace with your team. It was great to hear common themes pertaining to workforce, sometimes simple ones that are important to consistently reiterate, things such as fostering a sense of belonging, creating that desired workplace culture and vision, employee engagement, which are all consistent with communication and sharing information. Succession planning takes great leadership and is key to an organization's long-term success, allowing you to identify and continually groom individuals for that next key position. Leadership, mentorship, and kindness. Recruiting, retaining, and growing your workforce. They are all directly linked. Thanks for listening. Kindness is cool and have a great week. And now a look at the future of public transportation. I want to let you know that I'll be attending the APTA Tech Conference coming up in the middle of August, uh, 14th through 18th in Denver. Looking forward to being there along with some friends. We're going to be filming an episode of Transit Unplugged TV at the conference itself. We'll be interviewing Paul Scatellis and other folks there, other CEOs and executives at the show. I'll also be speaking there on a panel along with my good friend, Carlos Cruz Casas, the Chief Innovation Officer of Miami-Dade Transit, along with Gregory Ellsberg and Matthew Widener from uh, the King County Metro System and Dallas Dart. We'll be talking about microtransit and paratransit and some of the latest trends. You'll want to hear that if you get a chance if you're attending the conference. 
And also we'll be filming an episode of Transit Unplugged TV while we're there visiting uh, the RTD, the Regional Transportation District. We'll be interviewing the CEO and COO of the transit agency, riding their vehicle, showing how to get around town. We've got an interview scheduled with Phil Washington. If he's not in Washington, then we're planning to interview him at the airport, talk about his uh, career path. As you know, Phil, the former CEO of Denver RTD and then LA Metro and uh, back now in Denver as head of their international airport, but has been nominated by President Biden to be the new head of the Federal Aviation Administration. So we'll be talking to him about that as well for an upcoming episode of Transit Unplugged TV. If you haven't checked it out yet, go to YouTube, just type in Transit Unplugged TV and watch our latest episode from Dubai. And now we'll look at an interesting study that came out from the Transit Center. Many of you have uh, worked with the Transit Center in the past. They're an important part of our ecosystem in the public transit industry. My good pal, Jerome Horn, has worked for them for the last year as Director of Transit Leadership Development. He and I were recently at the Comto Conference in Miami, and he mentioned a new study coming out, and it did come out on July 20th. I want to tell you about it. They talk about four factors driving the bus operator shortage and what to do about them. You know, bus operator driver shortages, to me, are really the number one issue affecting public transit agencies in North America and also across the world. And it's it's undermining transit agencies' efforts to recover from the pandemic and become the frontline mobility option that American cities need. And this new analysis from the Transit Center argues that those shortages need to have people confront them. And there's many structural reasons why so few Americans and other uh, folks are climbing into the bus driver's seat. According to this report, just released last week, more than nine in 10 public transit agencies are having difficulty hiring new employees, and bus operator positions are the most difficult to fill. You may recall that on recent episodes of Transit Unplugged, I talked to CEOs of major transit systems like Euless Cleckley in Miami, who told me he's been trying to hire 200 operators for months and uh, has been difficult. And up in Boston, they had 300 vacancies of drivers and they were been trying to fill them. And uh, midsize and smaller agencies are also too having difficulty. In addition, get this, the study says those shortfalls are forcing a staggering 71% of transit providers to either cut or delay service, while others like Los Angeles are postponing service upgrades that would increase shared mobility access in neighborhoods that need it most. The foundational challenge, though, has been relatively under-discussed in the debate about how to help transit agencies recover the riders they lost during the pandemic. Even as many are wondering why sky-high gas prices aren't tempting more people onto these transit agencies' shared modes. According to the Transit Center study, here are four reasons why it's so hard to hire and keep a bus driver on the payroll these days and what you might do about it. Low, low starting pay and high retirement rates. It's perhaps the most obvious factor driving the bus operator shortage is low pay. Uh, but the transit center researchers emphasized that it wasn't always that way. Back when baby boomers were first entering the workforce, becoming a bus driver was actually one of the fastest routes to the middle class for some folks until costs of living skyrocketed, pensions were gutted. The time it took to jump on the next pay grade swelled to as much as five years in some agencies. Today, according to the study, an MTA driver in New York City can expect to make $25.49 an hour on her first day on the job, or about 40% less than the living wage for a single parent of one in the region. Unsurprisingly, those lucky boomers may not even stay in their jobs for long. In 2021, the average transit worker was nearly 53 years old. That's more than 10 years older than the average American worker in other industries. And get this. A staggering 72% of drivers who climbed behind the wheel as drivers just seven years ago are predicted to retire by the end of 2022 or switch to a better paying job in another industry, like using their commercial driver's license to operate a truck. You remember we recently covered that story that Walmart was announcing six-figure salaries for truck drivers. Amazon, others, they're paying big money for truck drivers. So we're competing now uh, in this market as well. And while securing new funding for agencies to up drivers' pay and increasing signing bonuses is a must, also getting into the job in the first place can sometimes be expensive. Depending on the state, acquiring a commercial driver's license can cost thousands of dollars and take weeks or even months. And some agencies are make their applicants wait months and months prior to being added to a hiring list, even if all those barriers that were struck down. Experts say many agencies still need to rethink how they communicate about the hiring process to applicants and the benefits that await them when they jump through those hoops. Chris Van Eiken, uh, who was the um, 
is the program manager for Transit Center and the author of the report, said not everyone understands just how valuable it is to have a pension and affordable health care. So basically saying we need to communicate that better. The second big issue, according to the study, is workplace assault and constant indignity is the way they word it. It's really interesting, isn't it? Um, even the best compensation package in the world, though, may not be enough to recruit more bus drivers if they fear becoming the target of violence on the job. The Federal Transit Administration data shows that between 2009 and 2020, physical assaults against operators increased fourfold per unlinked passenger trip. It's a stunning statistic that even transit agencies themselves maybe haven't been able to tackle yet, despite a new mandate from Congress to form safety planning committees in conjunction with operator unions. Van Eiken said, I knew it was bad, but the numbers on assault were a lot more stark than I thought they'd be. He continues, part of it is that there's an increase in financial stress on a lot of folks right now, and a lot of folks are struggling to pay the fare. When they come up short, the only person they have to take it out on is the operator, he says, when probably he says that anger could be directed to the government at large and not just that operator. That's according to Van Eiken. He also points to the example of London as a way to maybe look at things differently. They physically separate drivers from passengers in transparent cockpits that still allow them to interact freely with their passengers. A model, he says, that works particularly well in concert with improvements at stations to make bus stops comprehensively accessible to people with disabilities without the driver needing to leave his or her seat to help them. And uh, other cities that have taken the potentially dangerous burden of fare collection off of operators by encouraging passengers to pay their share before they board. Seattle Sound Transit is even piloting an unarmed fare ambassador program to help deal with onboard issues as they arise, rather than relying on the person piloting an advanced multi-ton machine to double as a social worker, even while they're in motion. And of course, no conversation about operator safety can afford to neglect the importance of protecting drivers from COVID-19, heat-related health conditions exacerbated uh, by the recent heat we've had, and other health hazards. Number three, they say, is punishing schedules. This is a big one that I've talked about and heard from a number of people about. Being asked to perform the role of a driver, uh, social worker, ticket taker, and guide to the city isn't the only reason why bus operators are prone to burnout, according to the study. That's because too many agencies require them to work mandatory overtime and arduous split schedules to cover the morning and evening rush hours, leaving drivers little time to rest at home with their families in between. Van Eiken said, the way we build our schedules still assume that the bus driver's male, his wife is at home taking care of the kids and everything else around the house. He continues, but it's a hard problem to solve because at the end of the day, the schedule has to be fairly static to conform to what riders need. Van Eiken says that the pandemic may already be helping solve the problem of split schedules as transit commute patterns spread evenly throughout the day and agencies adjust their schedules to better serve all day riders, something advocates argue they should have done a long time ago. When peak runs simply can't be avoided, though, he says agencies should offer operators higher pay for nights, weekends, and even the awkward few hours they have to kill between rush hour shifts, along with subsidized child care and other caregiving services to lessen the burden and digital services to help them find other operators willing to swap an inconvenient shift. And finally, and this is a big one, and we haven't talked about it enough in the industry, no respect and no place to pee, according to the, the way the report uh, words it. Perhaps the most important factor driving bus operator shortage, though, is also the hardest to tackle, and that's the denigration of transit operators in American culture. You know, they're not seen as Ralph Cramden anymore. Those of you who've been around a while might know what I'm talking about, including the transit agencies themselves. Although, again, it wasn't always that way. This is um, a quote from the study. Van Eiken said, if you go to the typical transit agency today, the older members of the leadership teams tend to be folks that started as operators and worked their way up. The younger members, though, he says, typically don't have that field experience. They went to college and they have a master's degree. They just don't understand what it's like to drive a bus. That stratification is no more apparent than in transit workers' access to the most basic workplace facilities. Get this, a stunning 80% of transit workers say that not enough time is built into their schedules for them to simply use the bathroom. If they can even find one, given the dearth of public restrooms now in most cities, particularly during the pandemic, and a 67% report that they've experienced health problems as a consequence. Van Eiken says if a white collar worker at the MTA didn't have a place to go to the bathroom, the reaction would be, oh, that's horrible. We need to fix that. But the same thinking often doesn't apply to operators, he says. Van Eiken emphasizes that agencies must take systematic approaches to making drivers feel valued and heard, starting with strong pay, 
strong safety protections and schedules that they and their families can sustain. Mandated bathroom breaks and clean, guaranteed on-route facilities couldn't hurt either. And just as critically, they need to establish ongoing forums for agency officials to hear operator concerns, craft strategies to make their jobs better, and give them a path to rise through the ranks if they wish to. And uh, he says the end of COVID-19 will not bring the end of operator shortfalls. They will persist unless agencies address core issues with the job. To begin ending operator shortfalls, the transit industry as a whole must recognize the vital role that operators play and work to increase the attractiveness of the position. Transit operators are the backbone of the industry. I couldn't agree more. So that's a look at the study. A lot of it was quotes um, from the study and from the author of the study. Hope you enjoyed that input. Take it and um, think on it and see if there's some things that your agency might be able to adopt in what the Transit Center study uh, said are four recommendations. Thank you so much for being with us today on this episode of Transit Unplugged, where each week we bring you an inside story and what's happening in and around the transit world. Visit us at transitunplugged.com, our website. Subscribe so you can get an email once a week that tells you a little bit about what the episode is and then a clickable link where you can listen to the show. And as mentioned earlier, if you haven't checked out our television program, Transit Unplugged TV, do it today. Go to your YouTube app and just type in Transit Unplugged TV and enjoy. And tell us what you think right here on Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Stay safe out there. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged News and Views with our guests Alva Carrasco and Harold Humphrey of Latinos in Transit. Now, next week on Transit Unplugged In Depth, we have Henry Lee, CEO of the Sacramento Regional Transit District. When you're hearing this, there's still time to get your nominations in at the Podcast Awards at podcastawards.com for Transit Unplugged in the Government and organizations category. We really appreciate your support. And don't forget, head over to transitunplugged.com and sign up for our newsletter so you're always in the loop with everything that's going on in the show. If you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on Transit Unplugged, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.